Uh, this is uh, Chris Copeland, uh, the head hitchhiker at Hitchhiker's Guide to Humanity podcast. And today we are talking with uh, Ronnie, uh, the uh, human of Alien Matco. And of course, I am the uh, human for the Alien Crystal. Uh, we're talking today about the practice of circumcision in uh, uh, African culture. Specifically, we're talking about both male and female circumcision, how it started, communities that are practicing it, why it was started, and current practice in the modern age. Um, with this, we'll also kind of compare it to uh, the conceptions of uh, f- uh, mostly male circumcision in the, the West, um, as female circumcision, as far as I know, is not practiced uh, in Western cultures. Um, But it is an interesting uh, topic and I'm excited to uh, delve into this because I have a lot of opinions uh, of my own and uh, I'd like to hear the opinions of others as well. Um, So Ronnie, welcome today. Uh, Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi guys, I'm Ronnie and uh, I hope you've had a wonderful week and uh, let's get to discussing circumcision in Africa and all over the world. All right. Uh, so go ahead and uh, talk to us a little bit about um, how, um, first off, maybe we could talk about like just what is the actual definition of male circumcision versus female circumcision. And um, from a Western point of view, uh, I can kind of give my my idea of it. And then I'd like to hear it from the, the, the African point of view as well. Um, so in, in uh, Western culture, male circumcision is mostly practiced, but it's not practiced everywhere. In fact, it's very specifically mostly practiced in the United States. Um, and the history of that in America is actually quite um, interesting. Uh, boys were not circumcised for the most part up until about the early 1900s. And then, I don't know if you've ever heard of this cereal, Ronnie, uh, but the Kellogg's Corn Flakes cereal. Mm-hmm. So um, this is this is not uh, this is research that um, was shared with me by uh, someone who uh, is not circumcised in America, and he had a lot of curiosity around like uh, why there was this um, uh, reaction to people who find when they find out a male male isn't circumcised. Uh, a lot of times, it's looked on negatively in American culture, but in European culture, it's perfectly normal because most men here are not circumcised. Um, so in American culture, it got started because the owner of Kellogg's Corn Flakes was also a pediatrician, and he was also incredibly biblically religious, and um, he felt that uh, if he advised parents to circumcise their little boys, it would make them less likely to masturbate. That did not work. So uh, the entire premise behind it just wasn't... Uh, first off, it, it, I don't believe that masturbation is, is an issue that needs to be solved. Um, it, but secondly, this was an issue that wasn't solved by uh, circumcision. Circumcision, yeah. Yes, but it did just become common practice since everyone wanted their, their little boys to be good little boys and, you know, um, good Christians and, and all of this kind of atmosphere back in, back in the Victorian era moving into uh, the Industrial Age. And um, the, the man also advised lots of weird things like yogurt enemas. And it, he was basically kind of a nut job, but um, he was very successful. He owned a, you know, a very successful uh, cereal brand. Mm-hmm. And he was a successful pediatrician. So whatever snake oil he was selling, it worked. And uh, now the majority of men in America are uh, circumcised just at, you know, at birth. And um, so it only took him a generation or two to change the entire uh, perception of circumcision in America. Uh, Because, of course, our uh, European ancestors and our European cousins do not practice circumcision uh, Mm -hmm. at all. Um, uh, So what are go ahead and uh, give the point of view of of how male and female circumcision are looked at in Africa and how that uh, started in Africa. So just uh, let's start with male circumcision. In Kenya, it's it's like uh, it goes back to the traditions of uh, different tribes. Uh, there are some communities which practice it a lot, but there are others like the Luos and the Trukanas. Actually, it's not in our tradition to practice circumcision, but in communi- other communities, the Kikuyu, the Pokot, the Bukusu, the Kalenjins, it's like for uh, a rite of passage that uh, male. Uh, children have to go through for you to be uh, considered an, an adult. 
um, it has remained one of the most important rites of passage in such, some communities like the Kikuyu community which we were speaking about uh, last week. It's one of the communities which is very, very keen and strict on circumcising their male children. Uh, it is supposed to signify your passing from childhood into adulthood. Uh, if you are circumcised, you're viewed as um, a warrior, you're capable and expected to fight for your community, things like that. But when you are uncircumcised, even if you live to be a hundred plus years, uh, in the eyes of the society, of the Kikuyu society, you're still viewed as a boy. You are not allowed to get married or raise children because you're still a boy. You cannot do anything. Uh, of course, that was in the olden days, nowadays. But in, in these communities, like the Kikuyu community, it's like extremely strict on circumcision. Even now, in this modern age, if you're Kikuyu man and you're not circumcised, you, uh, you just look, you, 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 you seem like you're lacking something or, some, or something. Uh, it's practiced widely all over Kenya. There is no stigma that is attached to it. Uh, the practice, in fact, people who have these rituals uh, in their community, it's, it's actually like a ceremony that you have to go through. It has, it's an initiation ceremony that uh, is usually taken from between the months of October to December. Uh, it, you can be circumcised any, from any age, either between 18 to uh, 8 years to 17, 18, ritually, but of course in the modern times you can be circumcised anytime you want, even if your community does not practice uh, circumcision. Yeah. So then one of the biggest differences that I'm noticing is that it becomes a choice for the child when they are in their teens and not something that is um, automatically done as soon as they are born, correct? No, not as soon as you're born. In, uh, in most communities, it's done when you're like eight years or nine years old or uh, maybe up to like 17 years. It's actually a big ceremony where people, you're gathered. The, the, it's done maybe in some communities do it even years, maybe 2006, then 2008. Some communities gather the kids in the same age group or age set, uh, maybe in two, three or four years. Then they have like a community-wide uh, circumcision ceremony where the boys are put in a, in a specific place and then there's like the painted white all over, the singing and dancing and things like that. So it's, it's like a rite of passage. You have to pass through it. But in other communities, like in the Luo community, where it's not like a tradition or a belief or something that you absolutely have to do, uh, you, you can choose, like me, I have a son, uh, I can. I have. I did not circumcise him when he was born. Some do it at like eight, eight days old when they are born. That is for religious purposes. But me, I, I leave it to my son to decide because I'm not required by my traditions to circumcise him. So he will decide for himself when he's older if he wants to be circumcised or not. Uh, yeah, something like that. But in other communities, you have to pass through it for you to become an adult, for you to be considered an adult. That's, uh, that's actually kind of like um, the, 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 the theory that I think is, is best, is that you know, the, the child, when they are old enough, can decide for themselves. Um, because while uh, this, is, you know, uh, this is a practice that's taking off a, a part of a, a man's body that holds the majority of the nerve endings that are used in yeah. sex. And so it'll be cutting out a lot of pleasure that he could receive over the course of his lifetime. Now, if he wants to do that because it's part of his cultural tradition and he wants to support that tradition and follow it, then that is an amazing sacrifice and, and something that I absolutely support. Uh, to me, that's similar to saying um, uh, in, in Western culture, you know, um, I'm going to go through this rite of passage of getting my first tattoo or, um, yeah. doing something else that involves a lot of pain, um, and, and changes the surface of your body. Uh, it's body modification. And if we allow that in Western culture, um, through people coming to their own, their own decision to put that on their body, 
uh, because it represents something about themselves that they want to stand for, then I'm absolutely all for that. I think that's amazing. I've gotten several tattoos myself and I see circumstances, circumcision is, is a more extreme form of body modification. Um, yeah. but certainly one that, um, everyone should have the choice to do if they want to do it. Um, so that absolutely, I, I applaud your decision as a mom to, to, to give your child that decision. I'd already made a promise, you know, if I'd ever had male children, they would get to decide themselves, um, yeah. when they were old enough, if they wanted to endure that pain and, mm. uh, you know, be a part of that, uh, tradition. So that's, yeah. that's awesome that uh, you also came to that decision, which is interesting because last week we actually talked about how Kukuyu is the more modern tribe and Luo follow, follows more traditional um, practices. But in this case, it's actually the re reverse. The Luo um, are going with the more modern practice of not forcing circumcision, whereas the Kukuyu actively um, uh, prevent their boys from entering into adult society until it's done. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. an interesting concept. Could you talk about that? Yeah, so it's, it has never been a part of our... It's not something that we outgrew with time as, uh, as the Luo tribe. It's just something that has never been part of our culture, uh, circumcising our male children or female children. In fact, female children, now it's not... It's females, it, it's not done like completely, completely, completely. In the Kikuyu, the Kikuyus do it for the, their females also, but just some communities among the Kikuyus. Uh, it's it's a big thing in the it's it's so big in Kikuyu in the Kikuyu culture such that when we had this multi-party election thing in Kenya back in I think it was in 1992, the Kikuyus had a very big issue about having uh, a luo or a Turkana or a, a Luo president because in their in their eyes, if you're not circumcised, you're still a boy. So you cannot like lead uh, people, you cannot do anything, you're not allowed to do anything because you're still a child. So it's 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 not something we outgrew with time. It's just something that has absolutely never been there. Uh, if it was there because Luo's are really traditional and cultural, then it's something that I know that we'd, we'd have had to adhere to up to today, but it's never been part of our tradition, ever. So that actually, um, about, let's go ahead and, and uh, talk again about some, some other uh, aspects of that, because we've talked about male circumcision and, yeah. and the, the um, cultural issues around that. But uh, then again, on the, the one that is kind of... Uh, the kind of uh, the shocker for western culture is the idea of female circumcision yeah yeah i'll uh, go ahead and just give you my first um recollection of hearing about female circumcision um i was in, in texas i was a, a kid uh, i think um or preteen maybe 11 or 12 years old and i was watching a documentary on pbs uh because i i was a little nerd back then too and loved watching documentaries and mm -hmm. um, I was watching one on Africa, which was one of my favorite topics of documentaries uh, that was presented on PBS. And um, in particular, this one was talking about uh, female circumcision and it was preventing, it was presenting it as this kind of horrific practice. Um, and it, it talked with, uh, uh, the, the interviewer talked with survivors of, uh, and he called them survivors of female circumcision. Um, that they had been taken against their will, um, that they had been, um, this had been forced onto them with rusty instruments and in, in an unsanitized uh, condition. And many of them had terrible scars and developed diseases after this uh, from infections and um, rusty blades were used. It just, it was a, a painting, a horrific picture of it. And I kind of freaked out at this idea of like, oh my goodness, how could they practice this on their own children? And these girls were younger than me, uh, in some mm -hmm. cases. And then like the other part was sewing them up as well. And, and it, it was just horrific to me that, that, uh, little girls younger than me had been through this. Um, so now given that that's like my Western um, example of how I, I uh, learned about this, um, I definitely have some like preconceived notions uh, coming in. 
Um, so could you tell me like what which of my preconceived notions are correct and which ones need a little bit more cultural nu nuance? It's it's even in Kenya, it's it's something that has been practiced for long, but it's something but that is being outlawed or it's illegal now to do it because it's it's really like just like you've described it, it's really bad. And uh, there's a community which still practice it uh, under the radar, but it has become outlawed in Kenya. There are people who are very vocal about it, organizations which have come up so strongly about it. So there are communities which still practice it. It is uh, found in traditional groups or communities which are considered uh, highly patriarchal in the society. Uh, communities like the Borana, the northeastern side of Kenya, like the Morana, which uh, perform female genital mutilation for religious purposes. We have people like the Embu. It's a rite of passage for them into adulthood. You cannot uh, be perceived as a woman if you have not gone through female genital mutilation. We have people like the Kalenjins, which Kalenjins are one of the most patriarchal communities uh, in Kenya. Uh, they are famous mm, for the people who are famous for running, for winning marathons in Kenya. They are like extremely uh, patriarchal communities. Uh, there were women uh, have who have not been who have not gone through FGM in their communities are considered promiscuous. They are immoral, and they are said to be imitating Western cultures, which is something that they really are extremely against. They are also uh, very traditional people. Uh, we have others like the Kambas. The Kikuyus also do it, but um, for the Kikuyus, it's around this this uh, like group of Kikuyus, a sect called the Mungiki. They are this violent uh, political, they're, they're like really violent people. They are just actively reject all Western, all manner of Western influence, and they believe that uh, circum not circumcising their females is like an influence from the West. So they are known to force their women to undergo uh, female circumcision, uh, their wives, their partners, uh, their children, and other female members of their families uh, who have taken the Mungiki oath. If you are Kikuyu and you've taken the Mungiki oath, your, any woman uh, who's part of your family has to go through that. We have communities like the Kisis, the Kurias, the Maasais, who we talked about uh, in one of our reports also circumcise their females in readiness for marriage. Uh, they ensure that they are pure uh, sexually. Uh, according to them, it ensures sexual purity for their women and, and, uh, yeah, and things like that. So there are a lot of beliefs which, uh, which lead to them having to choose uh, this female uh, uh, genital mutilation for their women, which was, most of it is actually not... They're just myths. Most of, most of it is not even true. So then that actually brings up the idea that there's, a, there's different levels of female circumcision as well. Like in male circumcision, there's pretty much just the foreskin is removed. But in female yeah. circumcision, it can have a lot of different um, meanings. So I know that one of them is just like a notch in the clitoris. Is that correct? Just like a small yeah. notch that's got? Yeah, I've, I've heard that there are uh, different uh, forms. There's like removing the entire clitoris. There's, yeah, just the taking off of like a portion or just uh, something of the sort. Yes. And so, um, no, I, I, and I feel the same way about this as I feel about male circumcision. If this is something that the female decides to do personally to her body and she wants to support her traditions and her beliefs, then I'm all for it. But um it, it does need to be done in a safe way it needs to be done in under the care of a, a doctor in a hospital preferably so that there is no risk of infection and it needs to be done with a lot of counseling before and after on what to expect because yeah. it's going to completely change um the way that they'll experience sex for the rest in fact it will most likely destroy the way they feel about sex for the rest of their lives it's it's just it's not going to feel good anymore and yeah and that's um that's something that i think that that women should be aware of before they make that decision and i think a lot less would make well i don't think any of them would would make that decision once they see how extreme it would be 
Um, but do you think that a lot of them willingly make this decision because of cultural influence? No, not at all. Uh, because the, it's done to them when you're like eight or nine years old. You cannot really make any sound decision at that age. You, your parent makes the decision for you. And if your parent uh, grew up in the age or is like a traditional person or cannot stand up for themselves or their daughters uh, because this most of these communities which practice uh, female genital mutilation are like uh, extreme patriarchal communities. The man is the voice. You cannot say anything. You're there to procreate and that is the only thing that you're good for. So if uh, you have a mother who cannot stand up to the husband and who cannot rescue you from that, then you're eight years old, you're seven, eight. Uh, you cannot really... It's not a choice for you. It's just something that is forced upon you. That's why in most of these communities, the more empowered uh, women have set up like shelters or sanctuaries for uh, if maybe you have, there's a woman in your community or your mother or a woman in your family who does not want you to go through this as a child, you are like snuck out of your home and taken to such sanctuaries to grow up there because it's, it's not... Uh, for most of them, it's not their decision. It's completely not their decision. It's forced upon you as a child to undergo it. So then are more um, mothers and families sending their girls to these sanctuaries? Or are, are there, is, how um, numerous uh, of a problem is this? Is, or is it going down? Um, so, because the last time I, I uh, or the first time I heard about this was in 1990 ish and it was 1994 ish and it was so widespread um according to this documentary that like um so many african girls were going through this and 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 it was an epidemic but there were lots of things being done at that time to start changing the culture to start um getting these rescuing these girls um but so how has that gone? How has the rescue attempts, how has the change of attitude gone since 1994-ish? There's, there's a huge uh, change now. There's a very big difference. The first uh, thing that was done was creating awareness because, as I told you, there's a lot of myths that is surrounding the reasons why they, are, they choose to do uh, this uh, circumcision. As a rite of passage, you cannot change... Uh, uh, that that is something that cannot be like changed because they believe that uh, you have to. But there are other such uh, like reducing uh, sexual desire for women. If you, if you are a woman and you have not gone through uh, the cut, then you believe to be like you you will have like a very high sexual drive, which will lead you to being promiscuous and such. Uh, it will it makes the woman clean something of the sort. It enhances sexual pleasure for the man. So things like this, uh, if the clitoris continues to grow, uh, that if it's not cut, it will continue to grow and grow and grow and become like really long so, and things like that. Those are some some so, myths that this <laughs> those are some of the things that these communities used to believe. If it's not cut, it will harm the baby during childbirth. Things like that. Uh, you will not be able to have children. So it, a lot of awareness was done around this, some of these myths that they have. Because you, you go into a community and you ask them why, it's why they think this, this uh, circumcision is important for their women. And these are some of the reasons that they'll give you. That they believe that you will not be able to have, ch I will not be able to have children if I'm not circumcised. I'll not be clean if I'm not circumcised. Uh, my husband will not pay uh, a good enough bride price for me because I'm not circumcised. He will not be able to get enough uh, sexual pleasure because I'm not circumcised. So my dowry, you will not be able, first of all, you will not be able to find a husband. If you're lucky enough to find a husband, your dowry will be like extremely reduced because you're not woman enough in terms of sexual pleasure and things like that. So a lot of awareness had to be done around these myths to correct them and tell them that it, this uh, FGM does not really affect some of these things that you believe that uh, it affects or it helps. It does not help at all. So uh, with the education and awareness creation and modernization, a lot of women 
in these families have become empowered. This empowerment has has really helped reduce such cases. In every community nowadays, in these patriarchal societies, in every community you find such organizations or women who have just come together as women and are preaching to their, to their fellow women about such kind of things, uh, creating awareness on these myths and telling them the facts, this is actually what happens and da da da. So it has really like extremely gone down. Uh, it has in Kenya, it's the point that it's illegal. If you're found uh, cutting your woman or your child, you will be arrested. So it is done, of course, but now it has gone underground. Like the people who do it, do it like extremely secretly, but it has significantly improved. So that um, I'm glad that, to see that all these initiatives are working. Uh, I think uh, another thing that could be done is explaining to the men that it does not enhance their sexual pleasure in any way. In fact, I would, yeah. my assumption would be that if their wife is laying there and not experiencing one ounce of pleasure because she has been mutilated and cannot experience sexual pleasure anymore and is just laying there like a starfish, that he would feel much less pleasure than if he was <laughs> actually giving her pleasure too. So uh. to me, that just the idea that, that a man would enjoy sex with someone who could not enjoy sex is a little weird. Mm -hmm. um, it's weird. Yeah. Uh, I would be very cautious about, about dating any man who believed that. Um, so, it, and it kind of, uh, it, it, it is interesting to see that all these different, um, tales that have come around, um, about, uh, what female circum, the, the benefits of female circumcision, uh, in, in, uh, uh, these, these tribes, because gen like I'm listening to all of them and I'm going, well, okay, that's not medically true. And this doesn't mm -hmm. actually happen. And, you know, <laughs> we have the body of science behind this from, from yeah. you know, the last couple of hundred years of, of really delving into female sexuality. And we understand a lot more about it than we did. Um, you know, when, when, uh, when Dr. Kellogg was telling people that uh, circumcision would prevent their little boys from masturbating. So, um, <laughs> and, and I'm very uh, grateful to all those scientists who really kind of delve into this topic that, that uh, is, it's kind of taboo in all cultures. Sex is, yeah. is not something that's openly discussed in many cultures. And um, I think that that actually creates to a lot of, uh, creates a lot of, um, shame and taboo around speaking about it because mm -hmm. it's embarrassing and you know i'm even feeling that now because i'm a texas girl and you know growing up i was you know in the christian church and so talking to, even saying the word clitoris to me is still hard so <laughs> you know i'm just i'm just as repressed as every other woman on this thing. yeah so, uh, but it does, it feels good to like know that these conversations are happening around the world and women are getting to talk about their sexual health um, and, and, and show their, not just the, like their expectations, but their frustrations and, and um, uh, female circumcision is just one, one aspect of that. Uh, are there other conversations going on about sexual health, especially women's sexual health in uh uh, Kikuyu culture or Luo culture or other tribal cultures? Yeah, that is one of, uh, it's actually one of the areas that uh, have really grown nowadays. There's a lot of initiatives in schools uh, where these kids go on uh, sexual health and things like that. So uh, I think it's, it, it also needs to come back to the family. Uh, there needs to be a big sister or your mother to talk to you about such these uh, sexual things because most uh, of the beliefs on uh, female genital mutilations are around sex. Uh, so in, uh, in most schools, there are these people who go around these organizations which have made it uh, their work to go around and take, talk to girls about uh, periods and sex and things like that. So it's something that is really happening uh, nowadays, but it's still, like you said, it's still difficult for people in their families to talk about, especially mothers and their daughters in, in Africa. I, I've, I've, I've seen, I, I don't know if this is true, but I've just seen it in, in movies uh, about the West. When you are a, a boy or a girl, when you reach puberty, your parent will sit you down and talk to you about sex and using condoms and things like that. 
there are some who go to the extreme level of getting their their kids or their teens uh contraceptive so that they don't get pregnant is that true uh, well, it depends on the family. Uh, so when I was growing up, my mother did not have that talk with me. Uh, my best friend in kindergarten had that talk with me. So th thanks for parenting that away, mom. <laughs> And but, so it, it's again, and it's because of her own repressed culture. Her mother did not talk to her about periods or sex or anything. And so she didn't feel comfortable enough to talk to me about it. And she didn't know enough to talk to me about it. She wasn't educated yeah. herself on it. Um, and mm -hmm. there's still a huge uh, disparity in the quality of sex education in America compared to sex education in Europe. Um, mm -hmm. I'll give you a, the, the best example I can think of is um, in high school. I took a parenting class and so I learned how to raise a baby my senior year of high school. I also got pregnant my senior year of high school. Mm -hmm. I was enrolled in this course before I got pregnant. I actually found out I was pregnant the week before I graduated high school. But in this culture, teenagers, especially teenage girls, which were the majority of the, the students in that class, girls, are taught to raise a child. And mm -hmm. I asked um, my Dutch uh, partner here, what, you know, what did he learn about parenting in school? And he said, I didn't learn anything about parenting. They taught me how to put on a condom. Well, that will solve a lot of the problems <laughs> in, in, in American Western culture if we just taught that in schools. But to this day, most schools do not teach children in America how to put on a condom. And because of that, um, there's a HIV epidemic going on. There's a hepatitis epidemic going on. Um, we have a lot of teen pregnancy issues and, um, it's all because we're not providing our teenagers who are sexually active and will continue being sexually active with the tools they need to keep themselves safe. Um, because it is perfectly natural for teenagers to start experimenting with each other. That is just what they do. And if I had known yeah. that as a teenager, I would be a lot less repressed about sex than, mm -hmm. uh, than I am now. So um, I think that that's uh, something that I've even had to go through recently because I was repressed. I wasn't able to like express myself sexually or express my mm -hmm. needs sexually until I got out of that marriage that I was in where my needs weren't honored. It didn't matter what I wanted. And um, it, it felt uh, very controlling. Now, um, I'll give you the other side of that is that with my daughter, um, I had uh, conversations with her about the differences between boy and girl, boys and girls at the age of three. I also talked to her about safety at the age of three um, because this was the first time that I had, when I was around that age, that I had um, experienced uh, something that, that was uh, not appropriate sexually as a child. And I wanted to make sure that she was aware she could say no and that she needed to say no. And these are the reasons she needed to say no because her mind is not capable of dealing with the emotions of, of sex at the age of, at this young age. And yeah. um, so I started arming her with words to say um, with knowledge at starting at three years old. And now as she became older, I started giving her more knowledge, um, uh, just at age appropriate level, usually whenever she asked about it. And there were some things that she would ask about as she got into teenage years that I wasn't comfortable answering. And I just kind of had to tell her, look, Google it. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, there were, there were things that, and she has an, an uh, one of my best friend, Amanda, uh, who works with us at, uh, at Scott Transcription. Um, she is very knowledgeable about sex because she'll look up anything and everything. Whenever she hears something new, she's, she's all <laughs> over it online. So anytime my daughter had a question about it that I couldn't answer, I was like, go ask Aunt Amanda. She'll be able to tell you whatever you need to know, <laughs> um, or go Google it. So, um, when she turned 16, I put her on birth control, not necessarily because, um, I thought mm -hmm. there, she was actually, she wasn't sexually active at that time. She, I don't think she is now either. Um, but, uh, at the time I put her on birth control just in case she wanted to become sexually active and, or became sexually active at a, you know, spur of the moment thing, just reacted in the heat of the moment. I didn't want her to make a bad decision. And, re and regret that and have to pay for it for the rest of her life. 
Um, I wanted her to be able to make the bad decision and, but make it safely. Um, and you know, once she had that option, she's like, I'm not going to need it, but thanks. And it'll regulate mm -hmm. my periods and you know, that will help too. So, mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I think it's a great preventative measure. And I think that, um, if, if parents would have open conversations with their children about sex and about sexual activity when they're teenagers, you know, just at the very least, give them safety guidelines. If you are going to practice this, it's your body. And at this point in teenagehood, there's not much you can do to stop them. Um, at least be safe about it. Keep yourself uh, armed with knowledge and always yeah. use protection and not just birth control, use condoms too. So, mm -hmm. and that's pretty much, I think, yeah. I think that is one of the biggest issues we have in this country because we don't have, in our schools, we don't have like um a subject or a program called sex education what you're taught in school is what is taught in science the reproductive system and the, and then it ends up that using condoms and contraceptives that is not taught at all just uh an organization will take one day out of the time come and talk to girls for like an hour or two and then they're gone it's not an open uh discussion or conversation that you can have uh, just have openly. So I think that is one of the, the issues that need to extremely be addressed in this country. Make sex or uh, sex education part of like everyday and normal conversation so that people get to learn, uh, young girls and boys get to learn at a young age. In, in these communities which practice uh, female circumcision, first of all, there's a lot of illiteracy in such, com in such uh, communities. Uh, People, these young girls or most of the people have not gone to school. They're more into their traditions and way of lives. And I think that is what uh, has, so what, what they know are only these myths. They don't know the science part of it because then they don't go to school. They've not been taught. But as time has gone by, there are a lot of programs which are taking, or organizations which are taking uh, measures to keep these girls in school, to keep these young boys in school instead of hiding cattle. And things like that so that is also like really helping education is really helping uh, them come out of these circumcision practices so and that's something else that needs to be happening more in america we need better uh, sex education in america as well because the yeah. use of condoms is not taught um, safety is not taught mm -hmm. and um, it's basically an abstinence only is, is your option in American schools. And, and mm -hmm. that just does not work for 2020 in the age of Tinder. It's just not going to happen. It didn't work in 1950. It's not going to work in 2020. Yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. we've got to stop this epidemic of teen pregnancy in America. Um, and the best way to do that is to arm them with condoms and birth control. Um, just like they do here in the Netherlands. Another thing I, I do strongly believe in is the, that we do need to have, uh, and, th and this, will, this is going to probably get like a lot of different reactions depending on where you're at in the world, but I strongly believe that we need to have um, safe and legal abortion everywhere in America. Um, and I'll give you the, the same reason um, that uh, was given during the Roe versus Wade case. Uh, that decided that birth control um, uh, should be an option in America and, and abortion should be in an option in America. Because if you are a wealthy woman in America and you get pregnant, mm -hmm. you can just fly to Europe and, and get an abortion. Mm -hmm. Not a problem. But you cannot do that if you're poor in America. Instead, you now have to have a child in poverty. And the yeah. Roe versus Wade case classically proved this. It was a woman who had had several children already that she could not take care of. And um, she was not allowed to have an abortion, even though she was continuing to have children that she couldn't afford, that were going to be drains on the system, that uh, then now taxpayers had to pay for. Um, and obviously we weren't paying for them because we have several million children in poverty in America still. Um, so they're not being taken care of. Uh, we need to have options for these parents that are in poverty so that they don't have to continue having more and more mouths to feed when they can't even get proper contraception and uh, access to um, abortion. Um, 
So regardless of like the, the religious side of it, um, I'm not going to argue on, on whether it's a, like uh, a living being um, at conception or if it's not alive until the heart beats or if it's not alive until mm-hmm. it's born. Um, that's something that, that is more of a spiritual conversation. And, and I have a lot of beliefs on that as well. Um, which I won't get into here because this is specifically on the medical, um, access and the classism that is involved yeah. with this. If you are wealthy, you can get an abortion. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. If you are poor in America, you're most likely not going to get an abortion and you're going to end up on welfare. And so is that child. And mm-hmm. That's that's kind of my thought on it. But what is the the thought from um, African culture in general on abortion? And um, uh, then in, in specific, if you want to talk about particular tribes or anything like that, or your own beliefs. People uh, in in Kenya, particularly, there's a lot of uh, people have extremely different opinions <laughs> on abortion, just like anywhere. But majority are not against because. Kenya is an extremely religious country, so most of the people are against uh, traditions. But my personal beliefs, I think that everyone should have a choice. They should have their own choice to make. Uh, You cannot expect somebody to bring a child into the world who they will not be able to take care of or to love as much as they deserve to be loved. So if, if you you cannot carry a child, I think it should be your choice whether you want to. I when I got pregnant, I didn't want. I personally uh, did not want a child at at that age. It was like uh, a surprise. I actually cried when I found out that I was pregnant. But uh, I could, I could, I, I just couldn't because when uh, when I got to realize that ah, there's actually a baby in me, I fell in love with the with the kid immediately. So that is why I did not. Uh, like have an abortion I just decided to carry the pregnancy and just have the baby uh, but there's some people who this does not come to them You, if you don't want it you just don't want it at all at all it becomes difficult to love the kid it becomes difficult to take care of the child so why have the child in the first place why bring a child into the world who you will not be who will not have the uh, the quality of life that they deserve so that is just my personal opinion People should not like. It. For instance, uh, there's this Facebook uh, groups when you post that there. Just just the other day, I was reading a story about some lady who wanted advice. She posted that she uh, she's she's pregnant. The father of the kid has like disappeared on her, so she wants to get an abortion. But everyone in the comment section was like, "No, no, that's wrong. You'll go to hell." things like that you you cannot just just give birth to the kid give birth to the kid and then take the kid where do you want, where, where where is she expected to take, take the kid after she has given birth to her we don't have systems in america like welfare the kid will probably end up on the street uh so why bring a child into the world to suffer being living on the streets or something of the sort that is just my personal opinion uh, and I'm right along there with you. And in fact, I, I went through that same uh, thought process. Now, in Texas at that time, there was abortion was not even an option. There, I, uh, as far as I knew, there weren't any abortion clinics in Texas at that time. Um, and if there were, it was maybe like one or two, and you had to drive several hours, and you had to pay lots of money that you didn't have um, to get it done. So, and, and that's certainly still true today because recently laws have passed in Texas that have uh, shut down most of the abortion clinics. Um, in fact, they've even tried to sneak in additional restrictions on abortions being necessary services during coronavirus, um, saying mm-hmm. that it's unnecessary so that these, uh, these scheduled abortions um, that have been set up since before coronavirus was a thing um, now have to be delayed until after the epidemic. And of course, by the time the epidemic is over, these children are already born and in the foster system. So, yeah, yeah. I I, I love how they care about, you know, um, being pro-life up until the day the child is born. So (laughs) and then it's then it's a free for all to see who will actually take care of the child. Um, But yes, I'm in I'm in agreement with you. Um, I think safe and legal abortion needs to be an option. I think there needs to be a lot of counseling around it. Um, I've and I have had uh, a miscarriage and an abortion. The abortion was for uh, medical reasons. However, mm-hmm. given the, the fact that I was also, you know, 
at this second stage in my life when when this happened um i would probably just have had the abortion anyway simply because I know I do not want to bring another child into the world right now when I'm still trying to get my own life back on track mm-hmm. after my divorce. And yeah. so um, that whether it was a medical decision, whether it had to be a medical decision or not, I probably would have done it anyway, um, at which I didn't do when my daughter was born. Um, in fact, I had planned on giving her up for adoption, but my family talked me out of that. Um, looking back on it, it would have been a better decision to give her up for adoption because I had a, a great family picked out for her, uh, one that was quite wealthy, one that could provide her with everything she needed in life. And, um, and, and instead I went with what my family wanted to do. Um, and I do, I, I don't necessarily regret that because I had a great life, uh, growing up with her or basically, yeah, I was growing up with her because I was still basically a child myself. And, um, yeah, those are like some of the best memories of my life is, is raising a child. So, um, it was incredibly hard though. I wish I'd waited another 10 years for sure. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely agree that it needs to be safe, legal and available for those who want it. And definitely lots of counseling provided. Um, I also don't believe in hell, so that helps too. I don't, I don't believe that, that anyone's going to go to hell. Um, not just for like religious reasons either, but actually it's in the Bible. It does say that um, uh, killing uh, an infant up until something like the age of five is just a minor fine in the Bible. That's the only restriction on even death of an infant. Um, so I, honestly, I think that the, the laws need to be a lot more stringent about um, uh, abortion than they are in, a, in the Bible. Um, because I, I do think it needs to be term limited abortions, you know, first or second yeah. trimester only. Um, yeah. By third trimester, I think that's pretty much a viable human being. And, yeah. And, and if it was born during the third trimester, it would definitely survive. As long as there were no complications, it would survive on its own. So. Um, are, there, are there like um, people who, doctors who do it illegally in, in America or in Europe? Uh, in Europe, it's not needed. Um, uh, abortions are perfectly legal here. You can just go to the clinic and, and get your test done. And then get one. Well, uh, yeah, and um, most of the time it's, uh, it's just a pill that you take or a couple of pills that you take over the course of a couple of days. And it's incredibly painful. I've been through a miscarriage and an abortion, so this is, uh, it's really um, the worst pain I've ever felt. It was worse than pregnant. It's worse than giving birth. It was worse than having a period. It felt like I was dying. So um, when I when I say that pro that I'm pro choice, that doesn't mean I'm pro abortion, at all. I think that the choice should be available, but I think that people need to know what they're going to be getting into when they go through that level of pain, as well as the level of grief that you have afterwards. It's it's just like losing you know, a baby, um, there is, there is a, a lot of grief that comes with that. And so grief counseling needs to be a part of it. Um, whether it's, you know, uh, an abortion out of a choice or for medical reasons, there needs to be counseling involved, um, for, for the mental health of the mother afterwards. Uh, but yeah, here in the Netherlands, it's very straightforward. You call your doctor and you say, Hey, I think I might be pregnant. The first thing they will do is give you a morning after pill. Um, if it was in the last few days, uh, this does not cause an abortion. Like, uh, many, uh, Americans believe that this is an abortion pill. Um, uh, the day after pill is not an abortion pill. It only prevents pregnancies from happening by killing off whatever, um, uh, unfertilized egg might already be in your body. But if the egg is already fertilized, it won't work. You have to go back to the doctor for the additional pills and the additional yeah. pain that comes with that. So, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that I am pro-abortion at all. I think it, the best situation would be give people the, the, the um, birth control. Choice. Yeah, well, we give them the birth control first so that way we don't have mm-hmm. to have abortions. And yeah. then if something happens anyway, if the condom breaks anyway, give them backup options, you know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I definitely agree with you on the on on the uh, abortion issue as well as uh, it's definitely needing to be part of um, a conversation on women's health. Um, So hopefully those efforts will continue. And I'm glad to see that there's lots of changes being made around female circumcision. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, as far as my idea about um, 
because it's still mostly men in, uh, in certain tribes that are pushing for female circumcision. The women are trying to break free from that. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, women are trying to break free from that, but because most of the communities are uh, patriarchal communities, they, they are men, like, uh, just force it on them. And some mothers, some mothers also force it on their children because they believe in following the ways of their traditions and what their, their men, the men in their lives tell them to do. So these women that do agree with it are, are brainwashed. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, by the, the men in their lives to think that this is the appropriate thing to do. Um, yeah. So then would it not be helpful to also try to educate the men that, hey, you would actually have a lot more fun with a woman who, even if she's had sex with a hundred guys before, as long as she still has her clitoris, she's going to be a lot more fun than someone without a clitoris. And maybe I have, uh, I have worked in, in some in rural uh, communities uh, which have these like extreme like elders in the communities. Those people, I'm telling you, Chris, changing their minds, changing their attitudes is like the most difficult thing I have ever faced <laughs> in my entire career. It's difficult to change their ideas, their, their mindsets, their beliefs. It's extremely, extremely difficult. So it's, uh, there, there are, I, I'm sure there are uh, organizations which are doing this, our initiatives which are doing this. They are also talking to the men and uh, telling them that it, it actually makes uh, better sense if they, they were, their women do not get uh, cut. But it, I can attest to that, even the simplest things like climate change issues and things like that, and uh, how, how to farm better, just something as simple as that, telling somebody that you can, uh, if you do this, you will get more yield. It, just changing their practice from that is extremely, extremely difficult in, in communities which uh, take their traditions and their cultures very seriously. Yeah, I've uh, also seen that in America as well, including on the farming thing. Uh, that's what led up to the Dust Bowl in America it was over farming of the land and not rotating out crops enough and not leaving land fallow for a while. Um, and it took a lot of um, body of, of, of evidence, um, scientific evidence around agriculture to actually start changing some of those practices in America so that we hopefully will no, never face another dust bowl again from overuse of our land. Um, we are using our land in, in a lot of, um, uh, it's still using our land in a lot of uh, negative ways in America, especially um, with farming and uh, polluting around farming. So there's definitely a lot more work that needs to go on with that. And of course, we still have tr climate change deniers all over America, including our own president, um, yeah. which is a whole another <laughs> discussion about yeah. trying to convince old men to change their minds. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's just a, a human thing around the, the world. The, the older generation just, um, has a le less tendency to to want to change they like things the way they are and yeah. they're comfortable with that so the idea that they need to change is make it makes them so uncomfortable and especially if they're already kind of brainwashed by their own culture and their own values um that uh that they don't want to see um uh, they don't want to believe that everything they've believed all their lives is actually wrong yeah and that it kind of feels like um and I see the challenge in that when I'm talking to Westerners about even the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, when, I, when I have someone that says, oh, but all lives matter, and then I have to break it down to them and, and you know, explain to them that, you know, yes, of course all lives matter, but that's not every life is in danger right now. These are particularly people of color who are in danger. So if one house is burning down and the other house is fine, you don't put water on the house that's fine. You put it on the one that's burning down. Um, that's yeah. where the attention needs to be right now. That's why hashtag Black Lives Matter is a, a huge thing um, because it's it's not about all lives. It's about, in particular, Black lives being attacked. And when I've explained yeah. that um, to people, uh, they really resist saying, oh, now I get it. Now I understand. Um, and a lot of it is because they don't want to be proven wrong. They don't want to look like hypocrites for changing sides, even though they obviously do understand 
the point of it now. Um, so there's still a lot of resistance to it just because they don't want to be wrong. It's their pride about being right. Yeah. Um, I think that's a cultural thing everywhere. Uh, is that what you also see with um, the, the, re the resistance to change from the older generation? Yeah, there's a lot of resistance. Yeah, you, you're an elder in our community. You're the one who people look up to. You're the one who has been teaching uh, all the other people about your traditions and cultures. So it's very difficult for somebody from outside your community to come and tell you that uh, uh, what, you've, what you've believed for so long, what was taught by your father and your grandfather before you, what you've been teaching your kids and your community is wrong. So you like need to to start teaching them uh, different things, start talking about uh, your cultures and traditions in a different way. That is something that uh, most elders just don't embrace. It is very difficult for them, like you said, to accept that they are wrong, uh, to embrace such. So that is, I think that is the root cause of them not being uh, being able to embrace change in some of these things like circumcision, female uh, circumcision issues, because yeah, that is something that they've believed for so long that they've they themselves have passed the knowledge for so long. So it's so. But I think uh, as the older generation is dying off, uh, some of these practices will also die off uh, with them in the next uh, decades. In the next coming decades, I think uh, more people will be empowered. This old generation that is more resistant to change will have died off and we will have a, a significant reduction in some of these uh, practices. I think that's uh, actually just a, a really good point to, to discuss is that, um, yeah, okay, so this sounds very like morbid that, you know, it, it is going to take this older generation dying off for us to, to create real change in the world, but that is what's happening. Um, the, the less that there are uh, people who have these ideas and promote these ideas, the more there are, you know, modern people with who are educated and who are coming in and, and saying, no, this is really the reality of the situation. And this is how we can have better, more productive lives um, by following scientific and medical best practices um, for our communities. And um, yeah, I think I think that change is also going to it is starting to happen in America. I think it has a long way to go, um, but you already see it in European culture, and um, it's it's become so, such a more equal place here. Now there's still lots of problems with equality um, and and equal access in Europe as well. But as far as like the cultures that I've seen and the 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 advancement they are, uh, they are at on this um, scale of time. Um, America is still very much stuck back in the industrial age, and um, Europe is moving forward into uh, the postmodern age at a much more rapid pace. I think uh, so is Asia. Um, so we'll see a lot of uh, new concepts for how to um, handle societal problems using science and data, uh, data-driven solutions is going to be the wave of the future. Um, one thing in particular that uh, just started happening here in uh, Europe is this um, dashboard that we're using to track coronavirus. And this dashboard will at first be just used to track coronavirus um, and to make sure that we can keep the spread under control and, and trace uh, people who might have come into contact with it. Um, but it will also be used to help in the future with uh, traffic lights, with train schedules, with uh, all kinds of things that will um, make society uh, an easier place to live in. Um, so I think if we all start moving more towards, you know, what's proven by science, what can, and you know, I love the old traditions, love the old stories, but where's the science? Where's the proof that this actually works? And kind of turn it around yeah. on them. Say, you know, you say this is better, that this way is better. Where is your scientific evidence for supporting that? Um, because here's our body of scientific evidence supporting that. And it's staggering how much evidence there is to support the fact that female mutilation causes harm. And... Is there any body of evidence that they can bring forward that says, no, this is actually good for them? 
This will prevent them from growing long penis-like clitorises and things like this. Yeah, so I think just kind of turning it around on them and saying, you know, here's our proof, where's yours? And making it more about the proof than it is about defying the culture or defying the tradition. Um, what do you think about, about those aspects of just laying it out and letting people choose? Yeah, I think that uh, the people should uh, embrace uh, this kinds of uh, changes. Uh, one one second, Chris. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, just one minute. Okay. I was answering uh, a call. So what I was saying, mm -hmm. we such uh, there there are some 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 really uh, bad taboos which are associated with uh, such kinds of practices, which should not even be because they don't have like uh, scientific evidence, like you said that these things actually happen. Some just make up uh, stories to scare. To scare their children or to scare their uh, women into, uh, for instance, into abiding by these these kinds of practices. Uh, somebody, uh, there can be an ancient uh, tale or a story of this woman in the community who did not undergo uh, circumcision, and then uh, their their clitoris like grew really really long and something like that. But they they don't have any proof. If you if 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 one member of the community decides that uh, I'm not getting I'm not getting circumcised and I want to see what happens, that nothing is going to happen. So it just goes back to and uh, like telling an old tale that scares that is meant to scare such people. Even in male circumcision, uh, there are some Kikuyus who believe that if a person uh, is not circumcised, the gods will be angered, and if an uncircumcised man or a woman has uh, uh, children, there will be like uh, drought and the gods will be angered and they'll like bring their wrath down on the community, things like that. It's just scary stories, not backed by any scientific evidence. So uh, it will just people need to appreciate uh, science more and lean more on the side of science for evidence and for guidance than this old traditional practices which do not have any proof that they actually help in any way. So these old stories that they are, are making up or sharing or passing along sound a lot like the urban legends that we hear of in America. Uh, you know, the warning, you know, teenagers not to go out in parked cars with boys because, you know, there will be an escaped killer with a hook on their hand um, that will come and open up the car door and murder them all, murder them while they're making out in the back seat or something. Yeah, so, something like that. Yeah, that's that's what it sounds like. It reminds me of the, the horror stories that we tell teenagers in America to keep them from using drugs and having sex and going dancing. <laughs> so... Um, hopefully as, as the, the, the education level continues to improve, um, around this issue and around all, you know, science in general, um, in both America and in Africa, um, people will start leaning more heavily on that, that body of yeah. evidence. Um, so Ronnie, this was a great discussion today. Thank you so much for, um, sharing, uh, uh, not just your thoughts on, on female circumcision and male circumcision, but also the thoughts of the Lua culture, the Kikuyu culture, and um, all the other different tribal cultures uh, in Kenya. Um, and the progress that's being made to, to uh, end female circumcision. Uh, I, I'm glad to hear that that's continuing to progress uh, and it's not the, the horrific situation uh, that it was when, when I was a child first seeing that on television. Um, and that things have um, continued to improve, um, uh, and hopefully they will, you know, continue doing to, uh, more to improve sexual education, not just um, in America and in Africa, but all over the world, um, so that w women and men can can you know fully understand 
um, ourselves as sexual creatures, as beings in this world, and um, really start working towards mutual respect uh, on, on sexual education. Um, so thank you for joining with me today, Ronnie. Any last thoughts before we go? Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I think we've discussed we've discussed a lot, discussed a lot of uh, good things, and I can't wait for the comments on this one. Especially, people need to. If you have any any ideas or anything you've heard about uh, circumcision, male, female, whatever you are, just let us know down in the comments. Yeah. Yeah, that would be awesome. We would love to hear your thoughts on yeah. it. Or if you are circumcised male or if you're circumcised female, um, mm -hmm. what was your experience with that? I would love to hear it. Um, uh, thanks for bringing that up, Ronnie. And uh, thank you all so much for listening. And uh, we will see you again next week on Hitchhiker's Guide to Humanity podcast.